Hello, good morning, well, good afternoon. It's good to see you there. We had a great time this morning and um, trust we're having a great time again today. We, we sing because we are the children of God, don't we? We've been radically changed on the inside. Our nature has been changed. God, uh, God's love has been shed abroad in our heart. And then we, we love to sing as a result. And so it's lovely to see you today. We, um, we live in an interesting world as the children of God, don't we? We, uh, we really are those that stand in utter contrast to the rest of the world. Um, we are of a kingdom not of this world. We're on our way to our eternal home. And we really are sojourners and pilgrims and foreigners and strangers on our journey uh, through uh, this world. And we should be a discerning people. Uh, we should be those that, um, in possession of the mind of Christ, are those who have the grace-given ability to discern um, all that's presented before us. That's a character and a hallmark, uh, a requirement of the child of God. Let me read Proverbs 14.15 for you just as we begin. Proverbs 14.15 says, The naive believes everything, but the sensible person considers their steps. There's a lot of everything going around. <laughs> and we would do well uh, as the people of God, the children of God, to uh, not simply be so naive just to believe everything. And as elders, we are assigned with a sobering and special responsibility from the Lord. And we take that mandate very seriously. Elders are told in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 that we will give an account for how we have shepherded the souls of those entrusted to our care. James chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that as elders, we will receive a stricter judgment. Let not many of you become teachers, elders. 1 Peter 5.2 tells us that elders are to shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain but with eagerness. And so we have the real privilege to shepherd you, church family, this flock, not begrudgingly, not under compulsion, but freely and eagerly, believing full well that God has placed us into this role uh, as under shepherds of the good and kind and perfect shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, this afternoon, what we want to do is spend a little bit of time taking heed. Taking heed. Take heed is the Greek word. Blepito, meaning to be careful, to pay close attention. It's used twice in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. Once to refer to the care Paul exercised as an apostle in the building upon the foundation of the church, which he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, is the Lord Jesus. Paul was aware of the need to be very careful to honor Christ in all that he did, knowing that Jesus is the foundation of the church and all that is established upon the church is to be anchored in Him, pleasing to Him and under His authority. Second, it's used to refer to caution. To caution the person who thinks he stands to pay close attention lest he fall. Fall into worldliness. Fall into temptation. Fall due to being overconfident comfortable in their own wisdom and not resting secure in the true anchor of the soul of the Lord Jesus and submitting to his word and his wisdom revealed in the scripture. They're that kind of overconfident, overly comfortable heart attitude was displayed by Peter, right? With all the gusto when he said, 
In Luke 22, verse 33 to 34, to Jesus, you remember he said, Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And we know how Jesus responded. Oh, Peter, you will deny me three times. And such an overconfidence does lead to carelessness. And yet overconfidence doesn't only evident itself like it did with Peter. It's also made evident in our lives as believers today as we become less reliant upon God. Less reliant upon God, less informed by His Word, and less in step with His Spirit as we walk out our calling that is placed upon us as His beloved children who were called not to be naive and just believe everything, but to have our minds informed by the Word of God possessing the mind of Christ. And when that occurs, when we evidence this type of overconfidence that I'm talking about, by not having the word informing our worldview, but the world informing our worldview, what happens is we become then prone to wander, prone to wander into sin, prone to wander into secular ways of thinking, which in turn makes us complacent, Comfortable, can give us a false sense of security, all as we possess an ever-increasing man-made wisdom. This type of overconfidence, I think you would agree, doesn't lead to spiritual maturity. It leads to an increase in temptation, temptation to unfaithfulness, temptation to timidity, temptation into spiritual lethargy, ultimately temptation into sin. It's been well said that when we feel most secure... When we think our spiritual life and our doctrine is sound and strong, that's when we should most be on our guard, most dependent upon the Lord. I say all that because secularism, which really is the pervading worldview of our culture, has as its core all that matters is the here and now. But the Bible always plays the long game. Always plays the long game. God wants us who possess the mind of Christ to be thinking long term. We, I think you would agree with me, we live in intriguing times. We live in times, really, though, compared to days gone by, that have been lived in relative ease. I know some of the church family were young children when World War II was on, but I think when we survey our generations, we've lived our life in relative ease. That's not to say that life has been easy for us all, nor that life will be easy for us all, but to be compared to what has occurred in the life of Christians throughout church history, we have lived in relative ease. And with that kind of ease, if we're honest with ourselves, which we ought to be, can come complacency. Even worldly, secular ways of thinking. Being affected more by secularism and that worldview than we care to acknowledge or even care to realize. And so knowing not what lies ahead, for certain, for only God knows that, we do, as your elders, want to spend some time taking heed. We know our future in the ultimate sense is secure. We praise God for that. We know our we know that we are citizens now of a coming kingdom. We praise God for that. We have a city whose builder and maker is God. We praise God for that. And yet here on earth, as we make our way to that celestial city, as we live, as I said, of, as strangers and pilgrims and sojourners and aliens, as we live as the children of God living in stark contrast to the rest of the world, we truly are living between two worlds. And as we live as those who stand between this world and the world to come, we have a mandate from God, don't we? And it's to be salt and light to this world. We are salt to this world in our words, and we are light to this world in our actions, our conduct. And so thinking about our potential future here on earth as the church, and if it's not in our lifetime, it may be in the life of our children or our grandchildren, we really believe, as it pertains to what we're going to talk about 
this morning, this afternoon, is that it's better to take heed now than to be caught off guard, earthly minded, comfortable, unprepared. And so this morning, we want to take a time out of this. I keep saying that. <laughs> it started at 11.30. This morning, we, this afternoon, we take, want to take some time out of the regular Sunday, the sequential exposition of John, and spend some time together as a church family looking at the subject and sphere of the authority of the government given to them, established by God. The title of the message this morning is Delegated Authority. As Christians, we believe in authority, right? We submit to authority. In fact, contrary to the world, we are not marked by civil discord, but we desire to live quiet, peaceable lives working with our own hands. We are to give honor to those in authority over us, whether the prime minister or a king or a queen or a mayor or an employer and the like. We stand in contrast to the world because we do not speak evil of them. Uh, we realize that the scripture teaches us in Acts 23 verse 5 and Exodus 22 verse 28 that to speak evil of dignitaries is sin. We seek to bless and not curse them. We pray for them. We seek their good. And we stand out, as I said, from among the world in doing that. And yet, we do, however, believe there are things which can be made governmental law that we do and must stand against. Because in the ultimate sense, when the specific circumstances arise, we carefully, prayerfully obey God rather than government. There's a few examples of this. Let me give you some. If the government was to pass legislation preventing a pastor or a Christian from uh, refusing to perform a same-sex marriage, then we would uh, defy the government in that instance. If the government was to put in place a hate speech law where it became illegal to state the exclusivity of Christ as it pertains to salvation, of which I personally know uh, two men who have been jailed in the United Kingdom, uh, jailed, charged, jailed, and then later released at great expense uh, for that exact thing. Or if it were deemed illegal to state, just as 1 Corinthians 6 9 says, that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God, then we would defy the government in that. If the gospel message was declared to be hate speech, we would not be silent. But in defiance, not of God, but of government, we would proclaim and continue to proclaim the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. There's more examples, even the example of where Christians do defy the laws of the land today. When Christians practice controlled, loving discipline of children. But... We can all see in those ones that I just mentioned that if they were to be enacted by law, that would be warranted grounds for defying the government. And why is that? Because we have as our final and supreme authority the Word of God. We see those issues clearly. But how do you navigate? Defiance and compliance. How, how, how do you know when to comply and when to defy? How do you know when to submit and how do you know when to stand and disobey? What about this and what about that? And what about the present predicament that we're in where the government has written their own laws empowering them to shut down the assembly of the saints under the umbrella of this virus? It all appears to be quite the predicament with no clear answers. And it's with that in mind, I want to point us to our first heading this morning that I've titled heading number one, the quandary, the quandary. The quandary refers to a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. And, you know, we can easily agree if the government said to believers, do not preach that Jesus is the only way, that, the, that that is discrimination and hate speech toward other religions and by implication of the content of your message, Christians, those of other sexual preferences, 
Of which, by the way, as an aside, again, I do know two other men who have been charged and jailed and later released in the UK for that as well. If that was the law law of the land, then it would be easy, right? We would just say, well, we'll just preach the gospel anyway. Why? Because God commanded us to, and we have a great commission. I also, at the same time, believe that we would easily all agree that if the government said to us, as a church, your building is not up to code. It does not meet the earthquake strengthening requirements. They'd be hard-pressed to do that to us at present in here, but um, because we've had great strengthening in recent years, you know that. But for those who don't, we have. But um, if, if they were to say that, then and say to us things like, you don't have enough exit signs, you don't have enough smoke alarms, we therefore then decree by law that you're no longer permitted to assemble in it for safety reasons, then we would simply obey that order. That's simple. Why? Because we're commanded to obey civil authorities. Considering them to be what God has established, which is what is revealed to us in the Word of God. So in one, we obey government. Sorry, in one, the first example, we obey God over government. And in the other, we obey government to ultimately honor God. But here now is the dilemma. Here now is the predicament, the quandary. Does the government have the authority to dictate the terms of worship of the assembly, of the church, of this church, of this assembly? It's a complex question to answer on one level. And on another level, it's not so complex at all. Now, as we begin this, As we begin to look at this, this principle that we want to see today, let me say right off the offset, as elders, we do not believe we are in such a situation uh, as it stands right now to defy the government as it pertains to uh, the assembly. That should be quite obvious. (laughs) Um, Considering even right now we are submitting to all the requirements by the government for the present restrictions that they've placed upon us. But what we are doing this morning is taking some time to see what God says on the matter to help us to be careful in our thinking, should we ever be faced with such a thing in years or time to come. As I said, this is a complex issue indeed, but paradoxically, it's not complex at all. And what I mean by that is this, the last few generations, the 19th and 20th century, we have not had to think carefully through this issue. But the church historically has had to. Prior to 313 AD, the church was illegal. I mean, there's a a reason, right, that the writers of the New Testament and the disciples and the apostles were Basically all hung, drawn, and quartered, martyred. Church was illegal. And then at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the church and state separation began to be discussed and defined. As Rome, through Constantine, the Christianization of the Roman Empire began. And then as the Roman Catholic Uh, church began to rule and the papacy began to rise, the church had to face such things. I'm talking about the true church. They had to think carefully about these things. And when you go back and read about it, you see that this was an issue that they had thought about and had written. When you go and read the old creeds and the confessions, they have wrestled with this and written about it at length. And one clear outcome, particularly surrounding the time of the Reformation, was that according to Scripture, you do not have God, the government, and then the church. As though it was monolithic, meaning in one piece. And I think that's how we've understood it. I think if we're honest, that's how we've always understood the church. We've, we've imagined it to be God, and then government, and then the church. But instead, through the Church reforming according to Scripture, semper reformanda, always reforming, uh, 
down through the ages, you have settled in church history that God has, according to his word, established two spheres, two kingdoms, as it were, the government and the church. A civil realm, kingdom, and an ecclesiastical realm and kingdom. And one is not in possession of more authority than the other. Both are established by God and both are delegated certain spheres of authority. It is not government over church. And as I said, I think that's how we've only ever thought of it. If you were to get a hold of, for example, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' work on Romans 13, I would encourage that to you, you'll see a great survey, a historical survey that he does of all of this. And what's amazing to me is God is clearly doing a work around the world in the midst of all that's going on today to bring back to surface in the hearts and minds of his people a sphere of authority argument which we will consider today. And praise God that in the sufficient word of God, we find all that we need for life and godliness and for practice and faith, for the rule of faith and practice. You know, sola scriptura is the very heart cry of the church. And so even though we find ourselves in somewhat of a quandary over exactly what to do about all this, we thankfully have an encounter that our Lord has in his earthly ministry, which will help us to answer the question, does the government have the authority to dictate the terms of worship to the church? And to relieve the quandary, we see Jesus dealing with something of this issue in his day, setting for us both an example to follow and a key principle to apply. This morning's all about a key principle. It's not about all the weeds and minutiae. I want to present to you a key primary principle from the Word of God. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 22. You may be there already. Sam read it earlier. Matthew 22 and look at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. Here, this is Wednesday of Passover week. Jesus will be crucified as the final Passover lamb on Friday. And Jesus is inside the temple here. You recall from our last two times in John, we were inside the temple as well with Jesus. In the first time he went in, when he exercised his authority. By God's providence we were there and by God's providence we're here now. They didn't know who he was then in the first one, but they certainly do know in this second event here. They are seeking to trap him in a statement. Now the Pharisees, is what we read of there in the beginning of verse 15. Mark tells us also the Sanhedrin are there. You remember the Sanhedrin? They are the religious and political elite of the day. And they are filled with hatred toward Jesus right here. They are hoping to make him say something against Rome, Rome being the preeminent governing authority, so that he will be charged and arrested as an insurrectionist and a rebel. Luke 20, verse 20 says, They watched him and sent spies, listen to this, who pretended to be righteous, in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him, listen to this, to the rule and the authority of the governor, Roman governor. So those spies that Luke tells us about, they are what Matthew here calls the Pharisees. And look there in verse 16, the Herodians. The Herodians. To understand the Herodians, you need to understand the Pharisees. The Pharisees did not like Rome at all. They viewed Rome as pagan and unspiritual. The Herodians were Romans. They were, as their name reveals, followers of Herod, beginning with Herod the Great through to Herod Antipas, who was the king and governor 
So they were a political party. They were a political party. They weren't a fan of Jesus. They weren't a fan of the Jews. They were a political party. And But here you have both the Pharisees and the Herodians sharing one common enemy, the Lord Jesus. I think it would be naive of us to think for a moment that this is not the heart of the political and religious establishment still today. Second Corinthians 4, five tells us not to judge a matter before its time. God knows the intention of the heart. And so until we know, uh, have evidence of ill motive, you need to reserve judging a matter before its time. That is true. And yet, Unbelievers, regardless of their political persuasion or religious affinity, we see here they can each be in disagreement over many things, but they all unite to rally against Jesus. Listen to Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Listen to this. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together. Against Yahweh, the one true God, and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Whether or not we like it or not, that is God revealing to us the spirit and heart of the political and religious establishment, unregenerate political and religious establishment. They're against God. And they're against his anointed. Who's that? Jesus. And they are by implication against the children of God and the followers of Jesus. We cannot afford to be so naive. We, that's Christians, who according to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. And so Jesus is wrestling here inside the temple, not with flesh and blood. And by union with him, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood either. And so these groups come, political and religious, and they come, remember, pretending to be righteous, as Luke told us. Look at verse 16. Look at what they say. Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. That is hypocritical, that is deceptive, that is flattery, that is sinful. Teacher, they say. That's the highest accolade and term of endearment and respect that the Jews gave to one another. Teacher, you are from God. And because you are from God, you are not swayed by man. They're flattering him. They're telling the truth, though. Everything they said about Jesus there is true, which as an aside, shows us that flattery does not always involve lying. It involves even telling the truth. But the motive is what is sinful. Telling someone something so you can gain from it, instead of telling someone true encouragement so they can be built up by it. And so they come with this false piety, this flattery, and they ask, good verse 17, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? They just flattered Jesus by what they said. They also flattered Jesus by asking him his opinion, his counsel on the matter. Remember, they have as their aim to trap Jesus, not to listen or to learn to Jesus, about it from Jesus. Is it Lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not. Poll tax. That's the Greek word, kensos, which is where we get the word census from. The Jews paid other taxes, but this was the annual tax. It was particularly despised by the Jews because it was paid to Caesar. And what did Caesar claim? Caesar claimed that he was God. And so they ask about this specific tax, knowing that the Jews hated it. And also knowing that the multitudes of Jews at this time were endeared to Jesus. Throngs of crowds of Jews were 
were, were, were enthralled with Jesus at this point. What were they saying? You know, no one teaches like this man. No one speaks like this man. No one has authority and certainty like this man. He stands in contrast to the scribes and the Pharisees. They were enthralled by him. The, the Pharisees and Herodians knew that. And they believed there lays their trap. If he answered in a positive way to the tax, then the people enthralled by him would reject him. But what they really wanted to happen, and what Luke told us what really wanted to happen in Luke 20 verse 20 before, they knew Jesus wouldn't answer like that. They wanted Jesus to answer instead publicly say that that tax was sinful. And not valid, which would then lead Jesus to being taken away and charged by the Romans as an insurrectionist. They wanted Jesus out of the way. They wanted worship and temple practices on their terms. They were comfortable. Everything was expedient. There was nothing costly. But Jesus has a lesson to instruct. He has a principle here to teach. After he calls them hypocrites in verse 18, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? He knows they're hypocrites because he knows inside their heart. He then says in verse 19, look there, show me the coin. Show me the coin used for the poll tax. Only the Roman coin called a denarius could be used to pay this annual census tax. Verse 20. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Now remember, Jesus had repeatedly declared throughout his three years, of which this is the last week of, he had repeatedly declared and shown that he is God, that he is the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God. Whose likeness and inscription is this? In the mind of the Pharisees and Herodians, the political and religious establishment, surely now they're thinking he will denounce Caesar, who himself says he's a god. He's not going to give anything to and, a, and a, speak a positively about someone who, who says that he's a god. Surely we've got him. Surely we've got him in a trap they must have been thinking. But Jesus doesn't do any of that. He lays out a command now. And it's here we move from the quandary to heading number two for us this morning, the principle, the principle. Look at verse 21. In response to the question that he'd asked them, who's on the coin? They said to him, Caesar. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And with that, Jesus just split the world in two. And what I mean by that is Jesus just taught and Jesus just established the truth that God has established two kingdoms of spheres of authority in the world. Civil authority and ecclesiastical authority. You can hear in the word ecclesiastical, you can hear the word ekklesia, which is the Greek word for assembly which is literally what the word church means. God has established on earth two spheres, civil and ecclesiastical. And what I fear is that we are ignorant to the mechanics and outworkings of those two spheres. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it's because we have not had to think through this in any real depth. But one of the things that God is doing in amongst his purposes during this worldwide COVID ordeal is refining his church, refining his people, bringing the word of God to bear down upon their hearts and minds. Sola Scriptura. You see, what Jesus is saying in verse 21 is that there are two kingdoms on earth. The civil kingdom that he has delegated to be governed by Caesar, the government, and the spiritual kingdom, namely the church, that he has delegated be governed by Jesus. God has established both. 
both the church and the civil realm being delegated their authority by God, which we'll consider in just a moment. But here's a key part of all of this. Key part. Each kingdom, civil and ecclesiastical, is owed something. Is owed something. Owed something on the very basis of their spheres of authority. And each has limitations on their God-given sphere of authority. You know, I was thinking about this during the week. It's not the perfect illustration, but it's one. This can somewhat be illustrated by youth ministry. For example, the youth pastor and the ministry does not seek to usurp parental authority. But instead, it defers to the parents and defers matters to the parents. For the parents have been delegated authority by God. You see, the church is not endowed with divine authority to implement taxes or to issue parking fines or to sentence criminals to jail. For the church to do that would be an overreach of its mandate and jurisdiction. And then at the exact same time, What is true of the government is that the government was not delegated the authority and does not possess the authority to dictate to the church whom we shall appoint as elders, as deacons, as Sunday school teachers, as musicians, as ministry leaders. The type of songs we sing or the amount of people who contend to church on any given Sunday or the times or days we meet. The government does not exercise church discipline. To do so is to step outside of their sphere of authority. The government can mandate masks on a plane, on a bus, in schools. I gladly donned my mask on the flight back from Christchurch recently, saying to myself, Caesar is Lord of the masks on a plane. The government can limit the number of people in a restaurant. The government can require all taxis and Ubers, Uber drivers to display posters so people can scan them. The government can require all charities and trusts to keep contact tracing lists. That's all within their realm and sphere. But they do not have the authority because it has not been delegated to them by God to meddle in the ecclesiastical affairs of the assembling of the saints. To do so is beyond their jurisdiction because the authority of the ecclesiastical affairs of the assembly have been, as I said, delegated by God to Christ who then, having ascended to the Father, then, according to Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19, and 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 4, verse 2, mediates the oversight of the church, of which who, he, he is Lord, and he exercises his lordship through the Scripture, but he has mediated that oversight to qualified, ordained elders of the local church, of whom Acts 20, verse 28 says, the Holy Spirit has established and gifted to the church. The government have the authority to shut down the building. They do not have the authority to shut down the assembly. Those are two very, very different things. But he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What Jesus makes clear in verse 21 is that there are specific things... We are to offer government. Render to Caesars the things that are Caesars. And there are specific things we are to offer to God. And to God the things that are God. To government we offer our obedience to all that they require of us from within their realm and sphere of authority. To God we offer our lives as a living sacrifice in light of His abundant love and grace and mercy shed abroad in our hearts knowing full well that the only reasonable act of service in light of God's abundant mercies is worship. And the fullest expression 
of that worship is the corporate assembly of the saints. You know, it's been well said in verse 21, Jesus is teaching us to always render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, but to never offer to Caesar that which belongs to God. Just as the government is not a law unto itself, so too the church is not a law unto itself. And the, re- the very reason that is true is because both church and government receive their orders and their sphere of authority from God. Both do. Regardless of whether or not the government acknowledges God or not. It's a little bit like when you're out on the street witnessing to someone. They say, well, I don't believe in God. And I often say to them, well, if you stood in the middle of a highway and said, I don't believe in trucks, your supposed reality doesn't negate the true reality that a truck will run you over. So whether or not the government acknowledges the one true God doesn't, acknowledge, doesn't negate the reality that they are established by God. God is creator. God is sovereign and supreme over civil and ecclesiastical matters. And God has ordained three institutions in society for mankind to live under. God did it. Number one, the family institution. Number two, the civil institution. Number three, the ecclesiastical institution. God established three institutions for mankind to live under in society. Number one, concerning the family, the Bible tells us that God created and defined marriage, the institution of marriage. When the government redefines marriage, it has gone outside of its sphere of authority. They have no right to redefine marriage. Marriage is a family. God Established family. A father is delegated authority in his home and in his home alone. He's not to be tyrannical. He's to be loving. His authority is limited to his household. Mother and father as parents are in possession of delegated authority by God. We read about this in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, don't we? Where God commands husbands to love their wives, wives to biblically submit to their husbands, with the husband as the head of the home, just as Christ is the head of the church. And for children to obey their parents, and for parents to exercise their authority over their children by raising them in the discipline and instruction and the ways of the Lord. That's the family. Concerning the civil institution... Just like family, it's God who has established governing authorities. By now, I'm sure your mind is in Romans 13, I bet. So turn with me there. Look at verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Look at verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Look at verse 4. For it is a minister, it being the government, is a minister of God to you for good. Regardless of whether or not they acknowledge the one true God, they are a minister and servant of God. Regardless if it's the mayor, the serving politician, the prime minister, they are in the position they are in as ministers because God has appointed them and delegated to them a civil sphere of authority. And whether or not they acknowledge God or not, they will give an account to God for how they have performed the duty that He has required of them. You know, Jesus was asked a question by a leading government authority, a man by the name of Pontius Pilate, in John chapter 19, verse 11, who asked Jesus, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? To which Jesus replied, You would have no authority over me if it were not given to you from above. 
Concerning the ecclesiastical institution, we've seen family and civil, now ecclesiastical institution, God has, just like He did with family, just like He did with the civil institution, God has established the ecclesiastical institution. He's established the church. And the church is heaven's outpost here on earth. Where saints are equipped, where sinners are saved, where His own glory is made manifest through the corporate worship directed towards Him. And it is God the Father who has made the Son, by divine delegation, the Lord over the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 says, He, that's God the Father, put all things in subjection under His, that's God the Son's, feet, and gave Him as head over all things concerning the church. And Colossians 1.18 says, He... Again, speaking of Jesus, he is the head of the church. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6 tells us that the Father made the Son ruler over the house, the church. And so you have God delegating authority in the civil realm as he delegates civil authority to kings, presidents, prime ministers, that is the government, and he grants them civic powers that we are, submit, that we are to submit to, even when we disagree. Even when we disagree. In the ecclesiastical realm, God has delegated authority to Jesus, who, get this and mark this down one more time, who exercises that authority delegated to him by God the Father over his church through the scriptures and through his lordship of those local churches, which he mediates, remember, by the under-shepherds he gifts to the church, who shepherd under his charge, under his lordship, accountable to him according to the scriptures, as they lead, feed, and care for the flock entrusted to them. And so what is clear? From the word of God, whether or not the world believes it or not, what is clear from the word of God is that God has not delegated authority to Caesar, otherwise known as the government. God has not delegated to the civil government the authority to dictate the terms of the assembling of the saints as they worship. He has given that authority to Christ and having ascended to the Father, Christ, having sent the Spirit, delegates that authority concerning the assembly to qualified, ordained elders whom he places in the office of shepherd to minister the word, ministering the very thing of which Christ exercises his lordship over the church. You may be sitting here thinking, okay, Sounds okay, but what you're saying is at odds with Romans 13 and even 1 Peter 2. Well, let me say this. R Romans 13 cuts both ways. What do I mean by that? R Romans 13 tells both government and the believer how they should live and govern. And in 1 Peter 2 has implications we need to look at as well. But having been presented with the quandary and then having seen our Lord in something of a similar predicament in his day teach the principled command of rendering to government what that which is owed to them in their sphere and then having God established a second kingdom and realm that the church rendering to God what is owed to God. Let's now Close our time by looking at heading number three, the application. The application. As we unfolded the principle, Jesus taught in verse 21, when he literally split the world in half, teaching that God established a civil authority and an ecclesiastical authority, we certainly did begin to consider some ways this truth applies, but let's get a little bit more poignant now. Let me read for you a section of our statement of faith as a church here at Riverbend Bible Church. Written, I would add, long before the heat of any controversy, 
or any quandary. Quote, We teach the autonomy of the local church free from any external authority or control with the right of self-government and freedom from the interference of any hierarchy of individuals or organizations. End quote. Quote, we teach that the one supreme authority for the church is Jesus Christ and that the church leadership are all appointed through his sovereignty. The biblical designated officers serving under Christ and over the local church are elders and deacons, both of whom must meet biblical qualification. These leaders lead or rule as servants of Christ and have his authority in directing the church within the bounds of scriptural absolutes, end quote. The, that is not platitude. They are not cliches. That is a biblically articulated ecclesiastical mandate given by God to the assembly through His Spirit inspired word. Every sentence that I just read is literally marked by Scripture. Take a look at it for yourself. You see, what makes this issue no different to the issues that I mentioned at the start about if it was made hate speech to preach the gospel or, or the like. What makes this issue no different is that just like we would keep preaching the gospel if they said don't preach because we're commanded to, what makes this no different is that we are commanded to assemble. Hebrews 10.25 commands the saints to assemble. Assembly, assembling a church, as a church is not an option. The church is not a building. The church is an assembly. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we understand that we are commanded to observe the Lord's table. There's a command from God to us. Well, if you were to go and read 1 Corinthians 11, you would see the command that that is to occur when you gather. When you assemble, when you assemble, when you assemble. It says it four times. This is no different. This is not unclear. The church is commanded by God to assemble, and we are free to do so from any interference of any hierarchy of individuals or organizations. That is the civil realm. You see, as I said, Romans 13 cuts both ways. Verses 1 to 7 of Romans 13 informs us of the responsibility government has to protect its citizens, which it does, according to verse 4, by punishing those who do evil. With evil being that which is opposed to what God commands. 1 John 3, 4 says, everyone who practices Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. When Paul writes Romans 13, he does so from the posture of, look at verse 3, he does so from the posture that the government are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. We don't live in that day. We don't live in that day. We live in a day where evil is now called good and good is now called evil. What I'm not saying is because that's the case, we then have free reign to disobey civil authorities. Far from it. But when it says in verse 4, for it is a minister of God to you for good, and good by God's definition of standards is what God commands, you see where I'm heading. It is not good for the government to dictate the terms in the ecclesiastical realm of the assembling of the saints. It is not good. What I am saying is the same principle applies. Just because the government is tyrannical doesn't mean we have free reign to disobey them, but the principle still applies. We render to Caesar that which 
is within the sphere of their kingdom and we render to God that which is in the sphere of his kingdom. And what is in the sphere of God's kingdom is the assembling of the saints, the encouraging of one another, free from civil authorities meddling in the affairs of the ecclesiastical sphere. Now that does not mean we just disregard the virus or whatever. as Some kind of hoax. Absurd to think that doesn't mean we just recklessly gather however we so desire that too absurd far from it doesn't mean any of that what it does mean is that the local church has the delegated authority to assemble as the church not because they think COVID is a hoax but because while for a certain demographic as the data clearly reveals namely the elderly and most vulnerable a genuine health threat The church has delegated the authority by Christ to decide if that threat severity rises to the level of disobeying Christ's commands to gather as the church. The authority of Jesus Christ over his church, his precious bride, is, and you'll know this passage, it's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. We're having a church family round table next Sunday afternoon, 4.30 to 5.30. I'm simply not able to cover all the nuance and, and answer all the questions. And so as elders... We're going to have next Sunday, 4.30 to 5.30, the time of Q&A. Jesus is Lord. He's sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And he takes care of us. And he looks after us. And the church is not some group of the outwardly religious who gather The church is the people of God who long to be together, who've been radically changed on the inside. And for them, the means of grace is their lifeline. And so, not interested in being reckless, hasty brash we're interested in seeing this morning what God says in his word and how thankful we can be that God through the scriptures is still refining his church because I think for you and I think for me and I know for other churches and other elderships around the world we really did think of it as God government and church but in actual fact the church has always confessed two spheres two kingdoms civil and ecclesiastical whether or not the world believes it or not and so have a great day join us if you're able if you have questions they're going to send out a link and you'll be able to ask some questions i'm sure there's a lot of questions let me just close with one you may be thinking about first peter 2 First Peter 2 speaks of suffering unjustly, enduring mistreatment um, uh, patiently because that finds favor with God. You, you know, the application for that is, is, is not talking about the assembly. The application for that could be, just by way of a pertinent example, is if an unjust government or an unjust council put asbestos in the walls and anthrax in the carpet or whatever it may be and said, you can't meet here. Or they they mandated us to wear masks and shave our heads and dye our hair blonde or whatever it may be. We would suffer unjustly in that regard, but it doesn't apply to the assembly. Jesus is Lord of the assembly. And so I'll leave it at that. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and say thank you for this time. Lord, we, we look to you and we trust in you and
we're your children by faith, faith that you've granted us. And Lord, we know that you take care of your children. And here in this time, we are your church. And Lord, we know from your word that you take care of your church too. And, and nothing prevails against your church. Lord, we're not about being reckless. We acknowledge that you tell us in your word to honor, obey, submit to governing authorities. We gladly do that. We don't want to overstretch our mark, our bounds in that. We don't want to dishonor you in that. And yet, Lord, as we said, we do not ever want to render to Caesar that which solely is owed to you. And so, Lord, would you bless us, help us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is always, always at work through your spirit. I pray for these precious people before me. Lord, I pray that in the midst of this, they'd be able to rest in Christ and find joy in him. And Lord, we are a people most privileged. And Lord, would you watch over us, we pray, that would bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.